Good morning to all of you and welcome to the webinar series conducted by the Department of Political Science in association with the VK Krishna Menon Center. So today we are going to listen to a webinar on inter-Latin American relations. And as we all know, India is having very strong and unique economic and cultural ties with Latin America. Will the principles of global political economy say that a nation conquering more markets will be the post most powerful nation in the world? The scramble for world markets between the US, the China, and other nations are growing more aggressive each year. The fight for Latin American market is also growing. And Latin America, as we all know, consists of about 20 nations with different degrees of integration. And it's divided and disputed between both powers. We are also seeing the European Union also entering into the fray with its latest EU Mark III Mexico free trade agreement. India should also strengthen its economic ties and technological partnerships, and it depends on understanding the regional and rural differences. Definitely, India needs a tailor-made bilateral diplomacy addressing the specificities of region like Mexico or even small countries like Chile, Peru, Brazil, I mean, big nations like Argentina, Brazil, etc. India could enhance its efforts in smaller countries like Uruguay, for instance, the latest member of the Belt and Road Initiative of China. I think India is still not having a diplomatic mission. Today, we have Ambassador Rengaraj Vishwanathan as a guest speaker to reflect on India's relations with Latin America. Ambassador Vishwanathan has worked for the Indian Foreign Service for over three decades. A retired Indian diplomat whose passionate obsession for Latin America is well known in the diplomatic circles. He's a writer, a speaker, who always loved to specialize in Latin American politics, the markets, and culture, perhaps the most apt person to make thoughtful reflections. With more than three decades of experience and expertise in the Indian Foreign Service, he was ambassador to Venezuela, to Argentina, to Uruguay and Paraguay based out of Buenos Aires. He was stationed in the Ministry of External Affairs in New Delhi, looking after the Latin American division. He did very rich experience and expertise on Latin American affairs. Today, we are going to listen to him. A warm welcome to you through this lecture by Your Excellency. Thank you, Ambassador, for accepting our invitation. Good morning to all of you. Um, well, uh, uh, it's, it's a particular pleasure to talk to the students of political science, particularly in uh, Kerala, uh, because uh, there are a lot of similarities, as you mentioned, between uh, Kerala and uh, Latin America in uh, politics and football and in uh, literature uh, uh, you know you had uh, i think you created a record in world history by electing the first marxist government in the world in 1957 and it was promptly overthrown and the chileans they did the same in 1973 and there also it was overthrown and uh, in u.s state uh, left is uh, going from strength to strength and so it is the case in uh, latin america too uh, the left uh, has been emerging and re-emerging and re-emerging and it's, it's a cycle and uh, so it should be interesting for the political science students of kerala to follow the latin american politics uh, which is even more colorful more adventurous and more exciting. Uh, I was told that at one stage in Kerala, the uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez book, 100 Years of Solitude, was uh, the bestseller. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, some people in Kerala keep saying that uh, it was Ovi Vijayan who was the pioneer of uh, magical realism. Uh, but uh, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's controversial, but it is interesting that uh, in, in, in politics and in literature, you have uh, you know, common elements. And of course, the third element is the football. Uh, I'm told the uh, hotel room in which Maradona stayed in uh, Calicut has been made as a shrine now. <laughs> and uh, now today is the, I think yesterday was the anniversary of Maradona's uh, death. Uh, the topic given to me uh, is uh, Indo-Latin American relations. 
uh, these relations have evolved in three stages. The first stage was from our independence uh, to the 80s. The second stage is 80s and 90s. And the third stage is uh, in the 21st century from 2000 onwards. The first stage is what I call as a stage of mutual ignorance, indifference, prejudice, negative perceptions, and unfavorable uh, uh, perspectives about each other. This was the uh, from 50s to 70s. 80s, 90s, I call it as a, a stage of uh, uh, a one night stand, occasional flirtation, casual interest, tentative. And the third stage is the stage of mutual interest, attraction, and uh, uh, discovery and exploration of synergies and complementarities and the discovery of value addition mutually now the first stage i said is the stage of mutual ignorance uh, indifference and negative perceptions uh, you know in latin america uh, in those days people thought india was an overpopulated country too many people poverty, misery, lack of development, and uh, what you called as the Hindu rate of economic growth, less than 3% of growth. So they thought India was, uh, Indians were slow. So they used to have a joke about Indians in those days in Latin America. So how do you make uh, an Indian laugh on a Friday? How do you make an Indian laugh on a Friday? Tell him a joke on Monday. It will take five days <laughs> to, to, to understand, to appreciate, and to uh, reflect over it, and finally decide to have uh, uh, to laugh uh, after going through various arguments and television talk shows. So this was the perception over there. And they thought uh, with such a large population with so much of diversity and uh, backwardness uh, and the uh, history of colonization india would take a much much longer time to develop so they used to have a story in those days uh, that once there was a, a meeting of uh, prime minister nehru uh, President Fernando uh, Henrique Cardoso of Brazil and President Gorbachev of Russia with guard. They had gone to guard seeking his help to develop the, uh, their countries. So first it was the turn of uh, uh, Gorbachev. Uh, uh, he uh, asked guard, guard, you know, we have changed our country uh, and change the history of the world by uh, getting over communism and uh, giving birth to democracy. Uh, so I want to develop Russia as a yeah, yeah, developed uh, state equivalent to that of United States in terms of prosperity and democracy and everything. And I want to achieve this during my term. His term was uh, four years. Uh, so God looked at him and said, sorry, Gurbachev, it will not happen during your term. It will take a, a generation for the country and the mindset of the people to change, and then you can achieve the new state of development. So Gurbachev started crying. Then it was the turn of uh, Fernando Enrique Cardoso, the Brazilian president. He said, you know, we have got over military dictatorship. Brazil has great potential to be a world leader. Now, uh, I want to develop Brazil as a first world country during my term of, of four years. Please help me, God. 
the guard looked at him and said, sorry, Cordoso, uh, it is not going to happen during your term. It is going to take two generations for the Latin Americans to uh, undergo a transition, a change of mindset before Brazil can join the first world. So Cardoso started crying. And then it was the turn of Prime Minister Narsimha Rao. But before Narsimha Rao opened his mouth, the guards started crying. So the guard said, Mr. Rao, I know what you are going to ask me, but India's development will not be completed during my term. And he continued crying. So that was the kind of perceptions Latin Americans had about India. And in India also, there was a kind of a reciprocal misperception about Latin America. So while the Latin Americans thought the Indians were slow, the Lat Indians thought the Latin Americans were too fast and too adventurous. So there was this joke about the Latin Americans. So there were the kids of the four kids. They were comparing their fathers, who is the fastest. So there was this Japanese kid who said, you know, my father is the fastest. He is the driver of the bullet train, 300 kilometers per hour. Uh, the French guy said, no, my father is even faster than yours because he drives the TGV, which is 400 kilometers per hour. And the American said, you know, my father is an astronaut with the space shuttle and, you know, he goes, uh, you know, thousands of kilometers per second. And then the turn of the Latin American uh, kid came. So he said, no, none of your fathers can beat my father. My father's office uh, closes at uh, five o'clock in the evening, but he's at home at four o'clock the fastest and that was the perception then there was this uh, 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 joke about the inflation or what you can call as the hyperinflation in latin america which was running into four digits and five digits thousands of percentage so there's uh, the joke was that uh, a, a, a brazilian when he goes to the bar he orders three beers not just one or two, three beers. And the reason, because the prices were going so high, if he finished one beer and then asked for the next beer, then the price would have gone up. So he ordered three beers. And of course, there was a mutual uh, joke about each, uh, both Indians and Brazilians. And that was that one can never say accurately the exact population of India or the rate of inflation of Latin America. Because by the time you finish the sentence, both would have gone up. So you can never say exactly. So that was the mutual uh, negative perceptions and prejudices against each other. That was in the first stage. So there were no relations. There were no relations because when uh, you develop relations, when you like somebody, when you admire somebody, when you need somebody, or when you find that the other person adds value to you, nothing of this happened in those days. Then we come to the second stage. There were internal developments in India as well as in Latin America. In India, uh, in the 80s and 90s, you had Rajiv Gandhi, there was of uh, fresh optimism. Uh, they thought he was a young prime minister and he was going to digitize the country and uh, new uh, uh, fresh approach to politics, uh, followed by uh, uh, the opening of the economy, liberalization and unleashing of the private sector in India. Uh, so the Latin Americans saw, yes, India is undergoing a transition. And on the other hand, in Latin America, uh, the military dictatorships were brought down in the 80s. Uh, democracies were restored. The military had gone back to the barracks. Uh, 
but the new democratic uh, leaders, they were a bit hesitant. They were still afraid of the military guys. Uh, and at the same time, when they were trying to formulate new economic policies, uh, the United States, IMF and the World Bank, they all ganged up together and imposed what is called as the Washington Consensus, uh, the policies of neoliberalism privatization, opening of the markets, and that kind of thing. Uh, but this had hit the newborn democracies economically. The uh, region uh, in the 80s uh, had uh, suffered even more poverty and depriva deprivation. So they call it as a last decade because of this slight political uncertainty and this imposition of this economic model of neoliberalism. In those days in 80s and 90s, India and Latin America looked at each other a little curiously and uh, with, with, with uh, skepticism, but seeing that there were signs of changes. So there were occasional visits, occasional delegations, occasional business deals, but they were not followed up because they were not sure that these uh, will bring about long long sting permanent change and then comes the third stage third stage starting from 2000 21st century um, and the the 21st century brought about a new perception new perspective on both sides the latin americans saw india emerging as a very large market as an economic power, as an emerging political power. This BRICS report had come and that had enhanced the image of India. And they were fascinated by this IT revolution. Suddenly, uh, names like Swaminathan and Sundaresan had become popular in uh, Latin America. And they thought all these are IT guys. Uh, so the image of India got enhanced and there was a new perception that India was becoming a, a emerging political power and a large and with high growth rate economic power and as an IT power. So then they started taking interest. They were attracted by this new India of the 21st century. On our side, Again, uh, there were uh, reciprocally positive new perceptions about Latin America because in the 21st century, particularly in the first decade and specifically between 2003 and 2014, Latin America had transformed tremendously, fundamentally, phenomenally. Uh, firstly, democracies had become stronger across Latin America. Of the 19 countries of Latin America, 18 were democracies, except Cuba, which is a, a, a socialist dictatorship. Uh, so the 18 countries for the first time in the history of Latin America became true democracies. There were elections and uh, presidents were elected and there were peaceful transfers of power. Uh, and uh, Latin America was the region with the least number of military dictatorships in the first decade. And uh, uh, so that brought about uh, a new confidence and optimism among the Latin Americans that yes, yes, we, we have changed and we are joining the mainstream democracies of the world. And uh, the uh, power had uh, gone from the barracks to the mansions, mansions of the oligarchy politicians, and to the streets. So for the first time in the history of Latin America, so power had shifted from the barracks and mansions to the streets. The masses were empowered, and they could 
elect presidents and they could impeach presidents and they could by protests and demonstration they can remove if they did not respond to their aspirations this was as a new game and this was a new empowerment of the masses so the masses naturally uh, voted for the politicians and ideologies which responded which uh, to their aspirations and the main problem was poverty and lack of development so the left took the lead and said yes we have a pro poor agenda and we are going to give priority to the common people's issues so across latin america in many countries they had elected leftist politicians uh, like lula chavez mojica and so on uh, and these people had given priority to reduction of poverty so in the first decade about 50 million people out of the 600 million had come out of poverty and joined the middle classes and fortunately uh, for these uh, uh, emergence of left which is called the pink tide at the time uh, china had emerged as, uh, as a big economic power with a big appetite for commodities food items and minerals uh, so china started buying uh, the commodities you know agricultural products from south america especially and this had increased the demand and the prices of commodities so foreign exchange had started flowing in billions of dollars into the treasuries of argentina brazil uruguay and peru and chile and so on so there was plenty of money to go around and this money was used by the leftist governments to attack poverty to uh, the, you know to for social spending to build educational institutions infrastructure so this decade the first decade of uh, uh, 2000 to 2010 was a, a unique decade in the history of latin america and it is called as the decade of growth and also it is called as the latin american decade and uh, the the, uh, the 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 region became democratic prosperous stable and they brought down inflation which used to be in thousands of percentage to single digit and there were no uh, big external debt issues you know latin america was always plagued by external debt but uh, in this decade brazil and argentina whatever uh, debt they owed to imf they had paid them ahead of schedule and the region was free from any imf debt this is the first time in the history of latin america so this gave a new confidence to the latin americans who uh, started developing collective strength by forming groups like mercosur unasur or uh, central american integration organization to develop collective strength and uh, they wanted to become autonomous in those days uh, latin america was known as the backyard of united states you all know about the monroe doctrine uh, but uh, now in the first decade of the century hello hear me it's okay it's okay it's okay okay so the latin americans they thought they don't have to be the backyard of uh, uncle sam and they can be independent autonomous and they started pursuing uh, 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 autonomy in foreign policy and of course uh, president lula of brazil he was the leader of this new latin america and uh, brazil itself was considered as as uh, as a new global power and so i asked one of the brazilians at the time so how is the relations with the uh, 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 united states at this time he told me a typical brazilian joke he said there was uh, uh, an american oil tycoon from texas he visited rio de janeiro he fell in love with the uh, beautiful Brazilian girl and proposed marriage 
They married and then took her back to Texas. But after reaching Texas, the first evening, he called her and said, come here, sit down. I'm going to explain to you the three rules of marriage according to our Texas tradition. So the Brazilian girl said, yes, sir, please go ahead. So this Texan Taiko, he says, the first rule, I'm the boss. So the Brazilian girl said, yes, accepted. Rule number two, I will do anything I like. I'll go out and come back anytime I like. No questions. So the Brazilian girl said, yes, sir, no problem. And the third rule, whenever I come back home late in the night at one o'clock or two o'clock in the morning, food should be ready, warm on the table and you should be there to serve. So the Brazilian girl, no problem, sir. And the Texan asked her, uh, you have uh, any queries, any clarifications, you have any questions? So the Brazilian girl said, uh, Senor, it's Mr. You have put three conditions. I have accepted all of them. But I also want to mention to you a small Brazilian condition. So what's that? She said, you see the bedroom there. There will be sex every night at 10 o'clock in the night, whether you are there or not. Yeah. Then the Texan understood. So that is how the relationship of Brazil and Latin America with the United States evolved in the first decade of Latin America as not only democratic, prosperous, united, collectively strong Latin America, but also an assertive, autonomous and independent region. This was historically unique. So naturally, India was interested in this new, emerging, prosperous, and independent Latin America. So it was mutual. So India started admiring and appreciating this new Latin America of the 21st century. And reciprocally, the Latin Americans shared admiration of India, which was emerging as, as, as a political and economic and IT power. So there is a mutual attraction and they started uh, exploring and discovering synergies and complementarities to see what value the other side adds to them. Now, uh, I'll explain to you the value addition. Now, what value did Latin America get from this new India of the 21st century? What use did they find from India? The number one was in healthcare. Indian pharmaceutical companies started exporting generic medicines, which are inexpensive. Uh, otherwise, the Latin Americans were paying a fortune, paying very high price for uh, patented medicines from United States and Europe. The poor people, the lower middle class people couldn't afford it. So the Latin American health ministers, led by Brazil and Chile, they invited Indian pharmaceutical companies like Ranbaxy and Cipla and invited them to supply generic medicines. And they opened their markets, they reduced uh, the restrictions and uh, uh, changed the regulations. And when the Indian companies went there with their generic medicines, not only that the Indian companies offered affordable medicines to the poor people of, uh, poor and middle class people of uh, Latin America, but the Latin American governments are also very clever. So what they did was they used these low cost generic medicines from India to put pressure on the multinational corporations, as well as their own Latin American companies, which are making 
high profits saying that we are going to get more low cost medicines from india unless you reduce your prices and they did so the latin american government and the people of latin america realized the value addition of india in reducing the cost of health care of the people of latin america as well as the budget and expenditure of the government because the governments were supplying to the hospitals and they were spending a fortune by importing from multinational corporations so they started importing from india and it, it, it was a win-win for everyone so today india exports over a billion dollars of these generic medicines to all the 19 countries in latin america and some of the companies they have set up factories in brazil and argentina and mexico and they produce medicines over there so any country you go the indian pharmaceuticals are very popular you will find them everywhere every health minister in latin america knows the value of indian generic medicines they see this value addition from india the second value addition they got from india is an in it today we have got about uh, uh, about 30 indian it companies including tcs infosys and wipro which have set up operations across uh, latin america and they are not taken you know thousands of uh, indians to go and work in their operations in latin america they have employed local people they have recruited young uh, brazilians and argentines and mexicans from universities trained them and given opportunities for about 35000 latin americans who work in indian it companies so these young Latin Americans, they get the opportunity through the Indian IT companies to work for the Wall Street, to work for big banks and multinational corporations. They get experience. And so this is what I call as the value addition in human resource transformation and training of Latin American young people by the Indian IT companies. These 30 Indian companies, which employ over 35,000 Latin American, they have taken only a few Indians, maybe a, a couple of hundred. The rest are all Latin Americans. And they're very, very happy. Now, the uh, uh, Latin Americans, uh, uh, how uh, the, the Indian companies do uh, a new business model over there in Latin America, which I call as 12 by 12. Uh, Many of the clients are in North America, in the same time zone as that of uh, uh, Latin America. So they do 12 hours of operations and back office and software development in Latin America. And the next 12 hours, they shift to India. So they do 24 hours of service to North American clients by using the time difference between India and Latin America. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the Latin American young people are fascinated and inspired by the Indian IT uh, uh, reputation. Uh, for example, there is, a, 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 as you mentioned, there is a small country small. called Uruguay. Is okay? You hear me? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, when TCS wanted to go to Latin America uh, in the late 90s, uh, they had recruited uh, a guy called Gabriel Rosemann, a yeah, Uruguayan who was uh, working with the Ernst and Young. And this Uruguayan, he, he came to give a presentation to uh, the board of TCS. And he told them, oh, you should start the operations from Uruguay. And the TCS board said, where is Uruguay? <laughs> so they had to look at the map and see this tiny little dot with, you know, you know, 4 million people and asked, you know, why do you want us to go to Uruguay? We should go to Brazil or Mexico, the larger markets. But he, in his typical Latino mischief, he said, wait. So what he did was he uh, told them, 
Okay, you will start with Uruguay. He went back to Uruguay. He went and met the president of Uruguay and said, Oh, this TCS, which is part of Tata's, which is $80 billion company with, uh, you know, over 100 companies, very reputed historical company of Tata wants to come to Uruguay. Please give some tax incentives. Please give some uh, uh, other advantages. So he got, you know, free land and building and lots of other tax and other benefits to TCS and said, come. So they came, they set up shop there, they recruited 2,000 uh, uh, Uruguayans and started operations. And the business picked up. And then when Accenture and uh, 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 the other uh, 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 global multinational IT companies, they saw that uh, TCS is doing well in uh, Uruguay and they're trained and their human resources available, then they also started going to Uruguay. Now, here is a win-win story. Now, this Gabriel Rosman put uh, TCS in the map of Latin America. Hmm? And today they do about a billion dollars of uh, turnover all over Latin America. And uh, thanks to this, Uruguay got into the IT map of the world. So all the IT companies in the world, they think that, oh, Uruguay is a good deal because TCS went there, they opened up the market and the others went. So this is a mutual win-win. And the Latin American youngsters, they get inspired by this hardworking, brainy Indian IT guys. And they see that this is a value addition to their society in terms of human resource development. And the third value addition to Latin America is in terms of exports. Uh, last year, Latin America exported about $15 billion to India. Uh, but in 2013-14, their exports were about $30 billion. So in 2014, India was the third largest destination for Latin American exports in the world after United States and China. Latin America exported to India more than they exported to their traditional trade partners like uh, uh, Spain or uh, Germany, France, Italy, UK or Japan. So they found that India has become uh, the third largest market for their exports. And it's not a one-year wonder. And they have realized that Latin India is a large and growing market. And uh, this uh, uh, trajectory is going to continue in the long term. So India is going to be a, a big destination for their exports in the long term. So they have started attaching importance to India. And also they found that Indians not only supply goods and export, but they also bring money and invest in Latin America, in production, in manufacturing, in services. Uh, this was another value addition. For example, there is this company called UPL, United Phosphorus Limited. They call it as UPL. Uh, is the largest Indian agrochemical company. UPL is the largest Indian agrochemical company. But today, this company does more business in Brazil than in India. They do $1.2 billion of business in Brazil, whereas in India it is 6,000 crores, less than a billion. And across Latin America, they do $1.5 billion of business. And they have manufacturing facilities for agrochemicals in Brazil, Argentina, Mexico. They are in seed development, new seeds of sunflower and soya, because they bought a company called Advanta Seeds. So uh, South America, which is an uh, agricultural powerhouse, has got value addition from this Indian agrochemical company 
which has set up plants or acquired plants, running them, supplying agrochemicals and new seeds to the farmers in South America. This is value addition to them. Today, Aditya Birla Group has invested over $2 billion in Brazil alone. Uh, they have got uh, large aluminum plants and they have got uh, uh, carbon black. And this is one of the largest investments. And you have an Indian auto parts company called Mother Sons from Noida. They have 29 auto parts plants in three countries in Latin America, Mexico, Brazil, and Colombia. And they employ 22,000 Latin Americans in their factories. They supply to the original equipment manufacturers like General Motors and Ford and so on. But it is one of the largest global auto parts company of India, which is employing 22,000 Latin Americans. So this is the value addition. And it's not only the big companies, even small companies, like from your own state, Kerala, there is this company called Muttut Finance. They have invested about $20 million in Costa Rica. They bought a, a resort, a beach resort called Zandari Resort. And they invested and they are running it with the Indian meditation and yoga and Latin American beach and sand and uh, sea. Uh, but the most interesting investment I found was uh, uh, a guy called Abdul Aziz. Now, Abdul Aziz is a wine producer in Argentina. He produces a high value wine called Chateau Hana. Now, you will see the paradox in that. Abdul Aziz is a Muslim. He is a winemaker in Argentina. And Abdul Aziz is a Tamil like me. He speaks Tamil. He is from Pondicherry. But uh, seriously, his mother tongue is Vietnamese. <laughs> because his father uh, had gone to Vietnam and married a, a Vietnamese woman. So his mother tongue is Vietnamese. And then he went to for studies to uh, France, he studied IT and worked with a big publishing company in their IT department. But then he started tasting wine and he liked it. <laughs> and he became passionate about wine, not only drinking, but he wanted to make his own wine. So he saved all the money he could. And as soon as he had enough money, he left the job in Paris came to Argentina, bought 20 hectares of uh, vineyard with a mini uh, uh, winery and is producing now Chateau Hana by Abdul Aziz, a Pondicherry Tunnel with the mother tongue of Vietnamese with a French passport. Hmm? That is globalization. <laughs> and uh, not only that, the Latin Americans find that Indian companies put their money and their uh, technology for investment in Latin America. They have also found that their companies can invest in this large Indian market and make money. Like, for example, there is this company called Cine Plus, Cine Police, C I N E P O L I S. Cine Police has the largest number of multiplexes in India. Fourth largest. Hmm? They have from Mangalore to Pune to Jalandhar and uh, uh, Rurki. They have in many cities. They have invested $150 million. Hmm? And they are growing. They are very happy with the business here. There is another company from Mexico called Grupo Bimbo, B-I-M-B-O. They have become the largest bread maker in India. They bought this modern bread, you know, the olden days we used to have this modern bread. Now it is won by this Mexican company called Grupo Bimbo. So they are making modern bread and they also got a company called Ready Roti, 
<laughs> to make chapatis and rotis readily in an industrial scale. And the, uh, uh, th there are other companies, like for example, there is a company called Perto from Brazil. They make ATM machines. So they have a plant in Jaipur. They make ATM and supplies to state bank and other banks. Uh, there is a company from uh, Peru, which is running a zinc mining operation in Jaipur. They are mining uh, uh, zinc in uh, uh, near Jaipur. But India does not have the technology for uh, underground mining. We have been doing only surface mining. But the Peruvians have got technology and uh, expertise. So we have got about 50 Peruvian engineers and technicians with the Peruvian company doing this mining operation near uh, uh, Jaipur. And they have the three largest IT companies from Brazil, Argentina, and uh, Mexico. They have set up operations in Hyderabad, Bangalore, Noida, and Gurgaon. They employ Indian IT guys to develop software and to service their clients in Europe and uh, uh, United States. Just like our companies are taking advantage of the human resources and talents of Latin Americans. So the Latin American IT companies are making use of the Indian talents. So this are, these are the value additions which the Latin Americans have realize that India is useful, India adds value to them in the long term. Now, um, the last value addition which they look at India is, you know, China has, uh, China does, uh, what, 10 times more trade with Latin America than India does. We do $30 billion, they do $300 billion. We have given a credit of about uh, $300 million to Latin America, but China has given $160 billion. We have invested about $10 billion in Latin America, but the Chinese have invested over $110 billion. And the Chinese products are everywhere, and the Chinese buy up the commodities and agro products of South America. But the Latin Americans have become more careful because too much of over dependence on one country is not good. You need to diversify. Like because they are the large scale buyer of uh, commodities from South America, they manipulate the prices. Now once when Argentina created a little problem. They imposed some anti-dumping duty on China. The Chinese stopped buying the soya oil from Argentina and screwed them. <laughs> and Argentina is the largest producer of soya oil in the world. And suddenly they lost the biggest market. So the Latin Americans want to reduce their over-dependence on China and diversify. And there they see a role for India. That yes, India could be not an alternative. We cannot fill in the shoes of China. But uh, if they can do maybe about 15%, uh, 20%, 25%, 25%, not beyond. So they see India as tactically and strategically as a, 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 an alternative to a limited extent to reduce their over dependence on China. So they have started looking at India uh, seriously for business. And also they, are, they admire the Indian democracy, how you have managed to not only survive, but flourish as a, a, a democracy with this uh, chaos and the problems and uh, the kind of politicians we have. So that gives them hope that if India can manage with these politicians and these problems, so <laughs> there's hope for us also. Uh, so they, 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 they started admiring India and there is a kind of a romance for India. 
So now you find more and more Latin American presidents and foreign ministers and delegations visiting India. Now, what is the value addition for India from Latin America? What do we get out of them? Now, the first thing is there is a value addition in terms of our energy security. You know, India is one of the largest importers of crude oil, petroleum in the world. We have been buying from the Gulf, the Arabs, and they keep blackmailing us, increasing the prices. So now we have started importing from Latin America. Uh, we have been importing anything from 10 to 20 percent, about average of about 15 percent from Latin America. Uh, Latin America has got surplus oil to export. Uh, Venezuela, Mexico, Brazil. Colombia and Ecuador, these five countries, they export over 4 million barrels of oil. And for Venezuela and Mexico, uh, United States is the largest market. Again, these countries, they wanted to diversify. Chavez wanted to reduce their overdependence on United States. So they looked at India and India was one of the uh, largest markets for uh, their crude oil. And for us, it, it was valuable because uh, the, the first one to go to import oil was the Reliance. So the Reliance, being smart as they are, they got oil from Venezuela to start with and told the Venezuelans, hey guys, we are going to import in the long term from you. Why don't you give us a good deal, good uh, prices? And the Venezuelans were happy because this is a new market and they wanted to reduce their over dependence on United States. So they found value and they gave very good discount for Reliance. So Reliance imported oil from Venezuela and took the discount to the Saudi Arabians and said, hey guys, see, this is what we get from Venezuela. <laughs> so if you don't reduce your prices, we will import more from Venezuela. So they played one against the other and they perfected this game. And now the other companies are also doing. So uh, uh, Latin America is contributing to energy security of India strategically by reducing our over-dependence on this Gulf and Middle East in terms of prices, in terms of supply assurance. And in any case, oil is going to stay for a while and we can count on Latin America for this energy security. Latin America can also complement uh, India's food security. Uh, we are importing about $2 billion of uh, soya oil mainly and also sunflower oil, edible oil. India has perpetual shortage of edible oil. Every year we import over 12 million tons and most of it comes from Malaysia and Indonesia. We import this palm oil. It's not a good oil but cheaper. Uh, but again, these guys were blackmailing us, you know, because they had the monopoly that were dependent upon them. So now comes the Latin America with the soya oil and sunflower oil, which are better, slightly more expensive. But uh, uh, it, 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 uh, we are using the same tactics with Malaysia and Indonesia, you know, reducing the duty on, you know, sunflower oil and soya oil and making the Malaysians and Indonesians to reduce their prices. We have perfected this game. But more than that, uh, we also started importing pulses. Uh, again, India is perpetually shorted, has a perpetual shortage of pulses. And we have been importing from Myanmar, from Canada, Australia, Turkey, and Latin America has become a new source. And according to agricultural experts, in future, in the next 20, 30 years, we might have to start even importing. Uh, say sugar because the in India the population keeps increasing and the land for agriculture is decreasing you know I come from a small village in Tamil Nadu near Trichy is 35 kilometers from Trichy city earlier my bus would stop at uh, six seven places but now it is, stops at over 20 places because on both sides of the road going to my villages, you've got houses, commercial complexes, uh, factories, and uh, urbanized. So we are losing every uh, hundreds of thousands of hectares of agricultural land 
for urbanization, for business, commercial purposes, and industry. Uh, but population keeps increasing. We have more mouths to feed. Secondly, we, uh, the water level is going down. We have problems in Punjab. The uh, water table has gone down. In Gurgaon, where I live, the water table is going down centimeters and centimeters every year. And we have shortage of water. And then we cannot uh, uh, dramatically increase the production uh, because uh, most of the uh, farmers in India are small farmers. They cannot invest in big scale in innovation and technology and equipment. So we have limitation on agricultural production. And you compare it with South America. South America has large tracts of fertile land. Brazil alone has another 40 million hectares of agricultural land which can be brought for production without touching Amazon. And they have got so much of water. Brazil has, you know, 20 percent of the fresh water reserves of the world. And they've got technology and they've got expertise. So South America in particular is an agricultural powerhouse, agricultural power. Uh, South America has the potential to feed another 500 million people easily in the world. So here comes the complementarity. We have shortage of land and water and more population and South America has surplus land and water and technology to produce more. So this is going to be the long term complementarity for our food security. Uh, we also found that Latin America is a good market for our exports. We, last year, as I said, our exports were $13 billion, which is not bad. And it's a large market. It's a market of 19 countries, 600 million people. And their average per capita income is three times more than that of India, about eight dollars $9,000. And their total imports are close to about $1 trillion which is quite large. Uh, so we can easily increase our exports of $13 billion to double to $25 billion or later $50 billion in the years ahead. So Latin America is a very large market for Indian exports in the long term. And we are doing exceptionally well in certain areas. Like I told you about pharmaceuticals, India is the fifth largest supplier of pharmaceuticals to Latin America with over a billion dollars. But we are doing better in motorcycles. Uh, today we export over $600 million of motorcycles, Bajaj, Hero, uh, TVS, uh, Royal Enfield. They have been exporting motorcycles. These brands are very popular over there. You know, at one time, I, three, four years back, Colombia was the number one destination for India's motorcycle exports. In fact, Hero has uh, set up a plant in Kali with an investment of over $70 million to uh, make uh, motorcycles. And Latin America accounts for 28% of India's global export of motorcycles, which is quite large. We are also doing well in uh, the export of vehicles. Today, the, the number one destination for India's export of vehicles is Mexico, or $1.4 billion. And our vehicles are going across to many countries in Latin America, and again, Latin America accounts for more than 25% of India's global vehicle exports. This is fantastic. Uh, we, so we consider that uh, uh, Latin America as adding value for us in the long term, just as the Latin Americans have realized the value of 
uh, the value addition from India. So this, what I have been telling you is mainly in business, markets, and economies. These synergies and complementarities and mutual value addition. But life is not all about business and money. You have to be something more. Uh, well, we are discovering this synergy and complementarity uh, in an area which the Indians are fond of. Films, movies, uh, cinema. Uh, now, again, there is discovery. You find uh, quite a number of uh, 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 Latin American actresses acting in Indian films. There's a Mexican actress called Barbara Mori who acted in an Indian film called Kites with Ritikesh Roshan. Uh, there is an Argentine producer called Pablo Cesar. He has produced a film on Rabindranath Tagore and his platonic relationship with Victoria Ocampo in Argentina. And Indian companies have started going for shooting to Rio de Janeiro, to Machu Picchu, like Rajnikanth went to Machu Picchu to shoot a film Yendiran robot and Allu Arjun, the Telugu actor, went to Bolivia <laughs> to see the salt fields over there to shoot a, a, a film. Uh, and there is this film called Dobi Ghat, Amir Khan. And you know, the music composer for that is an Argentine called Gustavo Santao Laja. And, uh, uh, and from your own uh, area of Kerala, there's a guy called Matthew Kodat, uh, uh, Malayali. He studied in Satya Bama University in Madras. Uh, but he always had a passion to make movies. And he got a job to work in a bank in Honduras. He went to work there. The first thing he did was he fell in love with a Honduran girl and married her. <laughs> and then his second love was to make films. And he started making films. He has made a Spanish film called Amor y Frijoles. It means love and beans. He has a company called Gokamaya Films. And he's a director and producer. He has produced another films and he also produced a lot of television films. So you have a Malayali film producer and director in Honduras, Matthew Kodath. But more interesting than that is a friend of mine called Prabhakar Sharan from uh, a backward uh, area called Motihari in Bihar, Prabhakar Sharan. He, like many young people in India, he wanted to go to United States. He couldn't do it legally. He tried the illegal route. <laughs> so he, 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 he contacted some agents, paid money, and went through Latin America, like many do. And he ended up in Costa Rica. And uh, the agent disappeared and he was left there. He was stuck there. So he did what uh, the smart Indians did in other places. He fell in love with the Costa Rican <laughs> and married her. And she's very rich. And she asked him after the marriage, darling, what can I do for you? He said, my dream has been to make a film. <laughs> she said, no problem. So she put up the money. So he produced a movie called uh, uh, Entangled the Confusion. That is the English translation. It's a Spanish film made in Costa Rica, in which the hero is Prabhakar Sharan from Motihari. He is the hero, actor, and director. And it is made in Spanish, but in the Bollywood style of song and dance and stories. So this is the first Spanish film in Latin America made with the Indian as a hero in Spanish. See the complementarity and synergy <laughs> in the film sector. And uh, am I? Oh, 12 o'clock. OK. <laughs> yeah. uh, one other area I will uh, touch, uh, and that is the spiritual element. Uh, 
in Lat across Latin America, there is this fascination for Indian yoga, meditation, and gurus. Uh, Sai Baba, Brahma Kumaris, and Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. Uh, and they have, there are thousands of followers across the region. Uh, President Maduro of Venezuela is a Sai Baba follower. He had gone to Puttaparthi twice. And whenever Sri Sri Ravi Shankar goes, he is invited to address the parliaments and congresses and the business associations in Latin America. He is very popular. And we have uh, a Brazilian called uh, Fernandes Oliveira. He came to India and uh, he has now become a guru. Now his new name is Prem Baba. And he uh, disseminates Indian wisdom and philosophy and tradition through Portuguese language across to Latin Americans and to the others. So you find that uh, uh, the synergies and complementarities have been discovered not only in business, but also in spiritualism and entertainment and even in politics, like for example, the uh, Eman Roy, many of you would know, he was a co-founder of the Mexican Communist Party in 1918. He had gone there because the U.S. intelligence was chasing him, so he escaped to Mexico. He lived there for two years, 1917 to 1919. At that time, he was very active in the uh, leftist circles over there, and he was one of the co-founders of Mexican Communist Party, which was founded much before the Indian Communist Party. And when he wanted to go to attend the uh, Communist International Conference in Moscow, the Mexican government gave him a diplomatic passport with a false name <laughs> to go incognito to attend the conference in Moscow. So you have uh, 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 this new discovery and exploration of uh, similarities and uh, 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 synergies and complementarities, which have established a solid foundation for India and Latin America to become closer and to derive more mutual value addition from each other in the long term. I think I've done one hour. Thanks. <laughs>